Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Like repaint, replay, re always means to do a game. The last part of that word, sitment, comes from an old word called sedentary, which means to feel. So the word resentment really means to re-feel. Now let's say that we're going through this scheme of life like we all have to, and somebody who's sick in self, their social instinct is out of kelter, their sex instinct or their security instinct, and they do something to me that threatens one of my basic instincts. Maybe they threaten my relationship with another human being. Maybe they threaten my self-esteem. Maybe they rip me off and take my material goods from me. Maybe they do something that threatens my sex life in some way. Now, when they do that, that's not a resentment. That's a wrong on their part for doing so. It does not become a resentment until I go off in the next room or I go home that evening and sit down in my easy chair in my living room and I replay, refill that thing in my head. Now, the first time they did it to me, they hurt me. But the second time... I'm doing it to myself. That's the stupidity behind it. They hurt me the first time, but when I replay it and I refeel that old pain, then I hurt myself the second time. And then after a while, I replay it again and hurt myself the third time. And it seems as though every time I do this, I'm not always too honest with me. Because it seems to me as though every time I replay that thing in my head... What they did got just a little bit worse, and the pain got just a little bit deeper, and what I did became just a little bit less, and you let me play it over in my head long enough, I'm able to sit sit there and say, well, I was just standing there doing nothing. And they came along and did it to me, and it's all their damn fault. You know, this little resentment thing I got up here in my head, little resentment machine that I have. It's kind of like watching a football game. I know you guys out here love football games the same as we do back in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And you're watching a good football game on TV, and the quarterback throws a pass, and the guy runs out there to catch it. And a lot of times the quarterback will throw it up high where he has to jump up in the air to get it. Keeps the other players from getting it. Now, the opposing players on that team, they have learned that while this guy's still up in the air, the instant that ball touches his hands, that's when you hit him. And you hit him, and he's got his feet off the ground already, and you turn him upside down. And he lands on his head, and his head goes one way, and his arms go another way, and his legs spread this way. And he's laying on the ground, and he's hurt, and you can really see that this guy's hurt. Well, the football game is just like the game of life. You're not going to stop it very long. The game is going to go on. What's going to happen is they're going to run out there and check this guy out. And if he isn't hurt too bad, they'll pump a little air in him, get him up on his feet, and he'll start playing again. If he's hurt too bad, they'll drag him off to the side of the field, put another player in his place, and the game takes off again. The game is going to go on. Now, the old announcer up in the booth, though, he's not satisfied with that. He's got a resentment replay machine. He says, let's look at that again. And he'll stop it. And he'll show it again. And this time it looks twice as bad as it did before. This time it is in slow motion and living color. And you can see how far his arm and his neck and his legs really did bend. And the expression of pain on his face looks twice as it did before, just twice as bad as it was. And after a while, the announcer will say, let's look at that again. 
And at a ball game's been going on for 10 minutes, and the announcer's sitting over here bouncing this guy up and down, up and down, up and down off the ground. Okay, we alcoholics are the same way when it comes to resentments. We've got a little resentment replay machine up here in our head. And we get up in the morning and we tune it up in living color. We clean the lenses on it because we don't want to miss anything. We want to record everything. We shine it on the world all day long. And we record all those things that they do to us that are bad. And we go home at night, sit down in our easy chair, play it over in our mind, make ourselves sick, and blame it all on them in the first place. Now, there's some days, though, when we alcoholics have a bad day. There's some days that we've got her tuned up in living color. We've got the lenses clean. We're shining it on the world. We're looking for something bad to record, and they won't do anything to us bad. Now, that's a bad day for an alcoholic. You know what we do then? By God, we record what they're thinking. That's what we do. And we're... <laughs> now, is there any way that God could enter a mind filled with that kind of crap? Absolutely not. You know, there's a bad, bad thing about a resentment. Because if you throw it out there long enough, Sooner or later, it's going to turn right around and come right back at you. And when it comes back at you, it comes back at you in the form of self-resentment. And we can't stand self-resentment. So after a while, it turns into self-pity. And we alcoholics love self-pity. We love to get up in the morning and put self-pity on as a cloak of dignity and go out the door and say, Here come, mean old world. Just do it to me. I know you're going to get me. You're out there waiting on me. You, know, you try to feel sorry for an alcoholic, he'll tell you in a hurry, Don't you feel sorry for me? That's my damn job. I'll do that. <laughs> and the reason we love self-pity is a sick, sick way to build our ego. Because after all, if we're important enough that the rest of the world is picking on us, we must really be somebody. A sick, sick way to build her. And God, we love that stuff. Now, if I want God to enter my mind, and I want Him to direct my thinking, then a part of my mind is being directed by resentments. I'm going to have to do something about their removal and get them out of my mind. And the only way I can remove them is to get them down on paper, take an inventory of them, and look at them honestly and truthfully and see if what I've been seeing is really the right thing. And I'm going to find out in the majority of the cases those resentments are not true. They are simply are not true because I've played them over and over and messed with them so long I've distorted the picture until they're no longer true, period. They are a very damaged and unsaleable type of goods. And if I can see what's wrong with them and see that they're not true, then my book is going to show me how to get rid of them and get them out of my mind. And then it's going to show me the most important thing of all. It's going to show me how to keep them from coming back in the future. And when I can do that, then God can direct that part of my thinking. But as long as I've got my mind filled with resentments, then God can't direct it, and it's just that simple, because whatever I'm resenting is directing the way I think. And I've made a decision to let God direct it, and if I'm resenting, then whoever or whatever I resent, then they're determining how I think, and God can't. And it's just that simple, Joe. Remember back on page 45, it said that the main object of this book would, was to able, enable me to find a power greater than myself which would solve my problem. And I've been looking here, and it said that we found things in ourselves which had been blocking us from that decision. So resentment blocks us from carrying out that decision that we want or to find God because he's within us. It may be covered up, he said, with pomp and by worship and some other things, but in some form or other it's there. And these are the things that's been blocking us, our resentment, our fears, our guilt, shame, and remorse that we have as a harm that we've done other people. And the book goes on to say resentment's the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it, that's the big word, from it, the resentment, stems all form of spiritual disease. 
for we have not only been spiritually sick, we've been physically, mentally sick and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Spiritual malady means not only my relationship with God, but my own internal moral fiber. That's what we do in resentment. Is the number one offender. Destroys more alcoholics than anything else. And then we have the instructions here on how to fill out page 65, basically. As Charlie said, in our zeal to find something harder to do, we skip over page 65 and go down and write our whole life story. Well, they put 65 in this book for a reason. That's the inventory process. And if you were like me, uh, I looked at the page 65. I didn't read any instructions, but I looked at page 65, and uh, I tried to figure them out. I don't figure too well, you know. But I tried to figure them out. And I looked at that first column and said, I'm resentful of Mr. Brown. And I changed my mind and went to the cause, his attention to my wife. Told my wife of my mistress, Brown may get my job at the office. I don't even know Mr. Brown. I'm already getting upset with him myself. <laughs> Then I skip over to the next column, it affects my, what part of self was affected by it. And I try to figure out what part of self was affected by it, because I don't know what, what self entails. We learned that this afternoon in the 12 and 12 and the first three or four pages. So I got a working knowledge of these words so I can fill out what part of self was affected now. But at the time, I was just reading them. I didn't know what they meant. You go back to Mrs. Jones over there. And uh, go to the second, change her mind again. She's a nut. She snubbed me. She committed her husband for drinking. He's my friend, and she's a gossip. Put my best buddy in, in the nut house. That's what she did. I'm no wonder I'm, I'm mad at her. And what part of the self was affected, I, again, didn't know, but so I had to try to figure that out. Changed my mind again and went to my employer. Well, you do this a few times, and first thing you know, your mind, if you got one like mine, says tilt. Oh, I said, oh, heck. I said, they don't want that anyhow. What they want is my whole life story. So I just skipped over these babies and went right to my life story and wrote down all the dirty, filthy, rotten things that I ever thought, saw, and felt, and done. And I thought that's what they wanted. But that's not, that's not what they wanted. The instructions are here in the book. And if we can follow these instructions, uh, we can fill this out. And I think, and Charlie and I talked this over a lot, that... The way to fill out this inventory on in page 65 is one column at a time from top to bottom while your mind is on one thing and one thing only. So it says here, now What we've done, one of the greatest causes of confusion, his example on page 65 is already completed, and we didn't know the procedure that he followed to complete it. So what we've done is we've given you an inventory sheet, a review of resentments. And we want to emphasize we're not bringing anything new into AA. And we've already got enough of those kind of things. That page that you have on resentments, if you will fold the last two columns under or cover them up with something, you would then have a blank sheet it has three columns in it. Column one, I'm resentful at. Column two is the cause. And column three affects my. Identical to the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. Now let's go to the instructions at the bottom of page 64. And let's see the procedure that we follow in order to fill out that blank sheet. It says, in dealing with resentment, we set them on paper. All right, we've got our paper here now. See, we listed people, institutions, or principles whom we were angry, period. period. Stop right there. We go to the first column, and we write down all the people, the institutions, or principles whom we are angry with, leaving a little space, as Bill did in the example on page 65, because that will come into play later. And just write down what our minds are on one thing and one thing only. Who are we resentful at? Let's write them down. People, that's self-explanatory. Institutions are those things such as the police department, uh, the federal government, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, the post office, all those institutions that we get upset with from time to time. Principles are those old, old guiding 
I hate to use the word laws, but I can't think of anything any better. Those old, old guiding laws or principles that we've heard all of our life, which interfered with our style of living. The Ten Commandments are a set of principles. When I was out there doing my drinking, I don't want anybody talking to me about the Ten Commandments, period. I'm breaking every one of them as far as I know. Maybe one I didn't. I might have done that in the blackout. I didn't want to hear about that. Another old principle I always hated said, what goes up must come down. I never cared for that one. Another one said, what you give out is what you get back. I never cared for that. Another one said, there are no free rides. You'll pay for whatever you receive. I didn't like that one. And my dad used one on me that I didn't like it then, and I still don't like it today. He said, son, if you lay down with dogs, you'll get fleas on you every time. It was those old, old things that people used to say to us when we were out there doing our thing, those kind of ideas. Now, I've never known an alcoholic yet that did not know just exactly who and what, by God, we're met at. We spend hours and hours and hours sitting around in bars talking about it. And the only thing we have to do is take it out of our head, put it down on this sheet of paper, going from top to bottom, while our mind is on one thing and one thing only, and we make that list. Now, you don't have to be highly educated to do this. If you can't write, you feed the names to somebody else and have them write them down for you. And if you really, really do it honestly, truthfully, to the best of your ability, I think you're going to be amazed before you get that first column filled out. You see, they came to me and they said, make a list of your resentments. And I said, I don't have any. And they said, oh, surely you do. Maybe you don't understand what a resentment is. And they explained to me it was to refill those old pains and those old hurts. And I said, well, yeah, I, I've got a couple of those. And they said, okay, put it down on paper. And I got a sheet of paper, left some space in between the names. And the next thing you know, on that sheet of paper, I'd listed a total of eight names. And I reached over and got another sheet of paper. And a little bit after that, I'd listed eight more names, and I got another sheet of paper. And then I listed eight more names, and then I got another sheet of paper. And I got up to about 152 names. And I said, man, you matter in hell at everybody. <laughs> I did not know that. You can only see one resentment at a time in your head. And I don't think any of us are ever going to see how much resentment controls and dominates our thinking until we get them all down on a sheet of paper see them in their entirety for the first time. Now, we made a decision to let God direct our thinking. And if we've got that many resentments, then those resentments direct our thinking, and God can't, and it's just that simple. Very valuable information just by filling out column one. Now let's look at the second instruction. He said, from it... Key word, the resentment stems all form of spiritual disease. See, I don't just get resentful here. When I get resentful, I get resentful everywhere and everybody because I've got a resentful mind. That's why all the names, because we're resentful everywhere, and we, of course we don't know that. Second instruction. We ask ourselves why we are angry, period. And beside, in, in the, middle, the middle column, the second column says the cause. And simplicity is the key. Because you notice here, Bill only used four or five words to describe the cause. He didn't write any long dissertations about why he was angry at these people. Simplicity is very much the key here. If, we're no, if we know who and what we're mad at, we also know the reason we're mad at them. And all we have to do is take the cause out of our mind, put it down on this sheet of paper in column two. Now, let's look at Bill. He, he listed four resentments here in column one. Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, my employer, and my wife. He probably had more resentments than that. I assume he just didn't want to use any more space in the book. In column two, he put down the cause. Why is he mad at Mr. Brown? His attention to my wife told my wife and my mistress, and Brown may get my job at the office. I'm like Joe. I don't blame him. I'd be mad at Brown, too if he did that to me. 
Hell, I don't even know him. I'm mad at him already. <laughs> He's mad at Mrs. Jones. She's a nut. She snubbed me. She committed her husband for drinking. He's my friend, and she's a gossip. Put his best drinking buddy in the state insane asylum. That's what she did. He's mad at the employer. He's unreasonable, unjust, and overbearing. Probably said, Bill, where were you all day Monday anyhow? How come you wasn't on the job? He also threatens to fire me for drinking and padding my expense account. Now, that's unreasonable as hell, isn't it? Yeah. Narrow-minded, too. He's mad at his wife. She misunderstands and nags. And she likes old Brown. And she wants the house put in her name. And you start tying together like an old Brown wanting the house put in her name. It's about time to get a little upset here. Very carefully, with just a few words. We're not writing any big, long essays. Just a few little short words to describe why we're angry. As I finished up the second column, I learned something that's become very valuable to me. I began to see it's not the people and the institutions that I'm mad at. It's what they've done to me that's got me upset. You know, you could take Mr. Brown out of here and put Mr. Green in. And if Green does the same thing that Brown did, I'd be mad at him too. You can take Mr. Jones out of here and put Mrs. Smith in. I'd be just as mad as at at Smith as I am Jones if she did the same thing. You could take my wife out of here and put my mistress in. I'd be just as upset with her as I am my wife. I begin to see it's not institutions and principles that I resent. It's what they've done to me that I resent. That's very valuable information. You see, we're getting ready to start out on a lifetime-changing job where we can develop the best possible relationship we can with the world and everybody in it for maximum peace of mind and serenity. Now, part of that process is later on. I'm going to be asking people to forgive me for what I've done to them. But by the same token, I have to be willing to forgive them for what they've done to me. And the forgiving process can begin to start right here when I begin to concentrate not on them, but concentrate on what they've done. That begins to get those names out of the picture. Very valuable information. Now let's look at the third instruction. You notice these words that we see here on the instruction on the third column are the same words and ideas that we get out of 12 and 12 and also the same words that we saw on that list of what part of self was affected. So here it says, in most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. We were burned up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal sex relations, which had been interfered with, we were usually as definite, definite as this example. And again, using that information that we had from the 12 and 12 and getting a working knowledge of those words, and now we can fill out the third column with some understanding. No, it's impossible for me to be mad at another human being unless they've done something to threaten one of my basic instincts of life. If you threaten my social instinct in any way, my self-esteem, my personal relationships, my prestige, you're going to upset me. If you threaten my security in any way, you're going to upset me. If you threaten my sex life in any way, you're going to upset me. In order for me to be mad at you and upset with you, you would have to have done something that threatened one of the three basic instincts of life. So very carefully, at the side of the cause of the injury, I put down which part of self was affected. Was it a personal relationship? Was it a threat to my self-esteem? Was it a threat to my material security? Was it a threat to my sex life? I put down the part of self that was affected. And as I go down through here, putting this down, the part of self that was affected, I begin to see certain patterns start to develop. I begin to see the part of self that I really, really, really have a problem with. If I keep writing down self-esteem, 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 I begin to see where self-esteem is a real problem with me. 
if I'm continually putting down security, 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 I begin to see where that is a real problem with me. If I'm continually writing down sex life, sex life, sex life, then I begin to see where the sex is a real problem with me. One part of self is going to stand out as I fill out this third column. It's going to be a combination of all three, but at least one of them are really going to stand out. One guy, maybe his main problem is self-esteem. Another one over here, maybe their main problem is security. Maybe another one that's in the sex area. But we'll never know that till we get it down on paper and take a look at it. And as I filled out the third column, not only did I begin to realize the part of self, which gives me a hard time, for the first time in my life, I began to realize where anger comes from. Now, I've always had a problem with anger all my life. And people would say or do something, and I would react with anger. And after I reacted and hurt them, I'd be ashamed of it. And I'd say, I'll never do that again. And turn right around and react with anger again over and over and over and over. And you can't do anything about a problem until you understand the problem. And I didn't understand where anger came from. I thought it was just one of those feelings that automatically came into your mind and you could do nothing about it. But today I realize anger is how I have chosen to react to a threat to one of the basic instincts of life. Now, if my instincts are right, and my relationship with God's right, and I've got it under control, you can say and do about anything you want to to me, and you're not going to make me mad. But I'll guarantee you, if my basic instincts are not under control, and my relationship with God is not right, just about anything you say to me is going to cause me to become angry over and over and over again. Let me give you a good example. I'm married to a lady that's been a member of Al-Anon for 34 years. And if there's any Al-Anon that's got a black belt, it's her. She got a big belt buckle right on the front of it. Real great Al-Anon. Fine lady, and I love her dearly. But Al-Anons get sick in self just like alcoholics do. Everybody does. And once in a while, she'll be a little sick in self, and she'll say or do something to me that really does hurt. Now, if my instincts are under control, my relationship with God is right, I find I'm able to say, well, the poor old thing. <laughs> she can't help it any more than I can, and it'll just slide right off my back, and it won't hurt me at all. Now, 30 days from now, the same lady does the same thing. Only this time my instincts aren't under control, my relationship with God's not right, and I react with anger and I romp and I stomp and I raise hell with Barbara and everybody around me all day long. Same lady did the same thing, but I choose to react to it in an entirely different manner based upon my relationship with God and whether my instincts are under control or not. Thank God I've learned that. Because you see, I can't do anything about Barbara, what she says or what she does. I can't do anything about any other human being on earth about what they do and what they, what they say. But I can do something about my reaction to it with God's help if my instincts are under control. And I'm in much less danger of getting drunk than I am if I let myself go and get angry and romp and stomp and raise hell. Very valuable information. Now, we filled out three columns here. We've learned three things. The first column, we've learned how angry we really are. The second column, we've learned it's not them that we're mad at, it's what they've done to us. The third column, we've learned the part of self that was threatened or that is affected. Let's look at the part of self that's affected in Bill Wilson's case here in each one of these examples. He he's said it affects my, with his, Mr. Brown, his attention to my wife. It affects his sex relation and his self-esteem. You know, if his wife gets to fooling around little Brown over there, finds out that he's better than, than he is, then she might cut him off at home, period. 
is he told my wife and my mistress. It affects, affects his sex relation and his self-esteem. Boy, that's a threat to his sex relations. He told his wife about his mistress, and as soon as the wife found out about it, she cut him off at home. She went over there and raised hell with a mistress, and the mistress has cut him off also. He has no sex relations left at all now. It's also a threat to his self-esteem. And after all, here we are going to work every day, paying our taxes like a citizen should, taking care of our families, taking the Boy Scouts out on Saturday afternoon, teaching Sunday school on Sunday morning, and all of a sudden this little story about me, my wife, and Brown and my mistress has now become neighborhood gossip. My God, what are they going to think about me now? If you don't think that's a threat to self-esteem, you go talk to Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> you go talk to that old boy named Bill C. that used to be up in Washington, D.C. They'll tell you in a hurry what this does to your self-esteem. Very carefully. He's mad at Brown because he might get my job at the office. Sex is security and his self-esteem. Again. Threat to his security. And again, a self to his self, threat to his self-esteem. What are other people going to think about me if Brown undercuts me and gets my job at the office? A very simple procedure, just a few simple words. We've learned three valuable things already. Now, to give you an example... We're going to do a couple from our own inventory sheets. Not going to do very much of it. But a couple just to show you an example and show you how simple this thing really is to do. <laughs> On my inventory sheet in the first column, the first name was this lady named Barbara. Thirty-four years ago, I hated this lady with a purple passion. If there was any way I could have gotten rid of her and not get caught, I would gladly have done so. I used to lay awake at night and fantasize. And I'd lay there and think about now, tomorrow morning when she goes to work, and I always believed in her being self-supporting through her own contributions... <laughs> I'd say to myself, tomorrow morning on the way to work, she's going to get run over by a big semi-truck. And it's not going to be just any trucking company. It's going to be a very affluent trucking company. And they're going to kill her, and I'm going to sue them, and I'm going to make a million and get rid of her at the same time. You people in here that are al believe me, we fantasize also, just like you did. We sure did. The second name on my resentment sheet was the Internal Revenue Service. If you wanted to see a guy come unglued, you just mention the IRS. And I would start jumping up and down, frothing at the mouth, cussing just as loud as I could cuss every time. I hated those people. God, I hated them. Don't like them today, but I really hated them then. Joe, who was the first name on your list? Name was Rose. Now, who was Rose? <laughs> He's been married, he said, to two of them seven times, married and divorced. I always wonder which one's which. So Rose was the first one. All right. I, really, that's how simple column one is. It's not difficult to do that at all. Let's go to the second column. Why did I have it in for Barbara so bad? She had the audacity the last year before she went to al to file for divorce on me three different times. She was spending more money on lawyers and stuff than I was spending on booze and everything else. And I really had it in to her for her to, to do that, for filing for three divorces. Why was I so upset with the Internal Revenue Service? It was very simple. They were trying to put me in jail. I'm madder than hell at them because they're trying to put me in jail. Don't like that at all. Joe, how come you're so upset with Rose? Uh-oh, she had an affair with another man. <laughs> he 
He's something else, isn't he? Huh? Let's go to the third column. What part of self was affected by Barbara filing for divorce three times in one year? Was that a threat to my self-esteem? Oh, yeah. What are people going to think about me? She's filed for divorce three times, and here I'm letting her come back into the house again. What are they going to think about me for doing all that kind of jazz? Is that a threat to my personal relationships? Why, certainly, if she gets a divorce, she's going to take the kids and she's going to leave, and I'll have no relationships with them at all. Is it a threat to my security? Oh, you better bet it is. By the time she gets what she wants and I pay the lawyers, it'll all be gone, period. No doubt about that. Is it a threat to my sex life? Well, yeah, I doubt if she'll let me have any after we get a divorce, huh? <laughs> It was hard enough getting her to do it the first time, much less after a damn divorce. <laughs> Internal Revenue Service, trying to put me in jail, is that a threat to my self-esteem? Yeah, boy, what's the neighbors going to think about this now when they see that, that they're trying to put me in jail? Is it a threat to my personal relationships? Oh, yeah. They're not going to let my wife and kids have anything to do with me if I'm in jail. Is it a threat to my security? Oh, yeah. By the time I pay the lawyers and all the fines, I'll be absolutely broke. No doubt about that. Is it a threat to my sex life? Yeah. Well, with the kind I'd like to have, yeah. There. <laughs> There may be some in there I don't want anything to do with, but the kind I'd like to have, yeah. <laughs> Old Rose, Old Rose having an affair with another man. Is that a threat to Joe's self-esteem? Yeah. Is that a threat to his personal relationships? Yeah. Is it a threat to his security? Sure it is. He's going to have to go to work now. She's been supporting him for the last 10 years. <laughs> Is it a threat to his sex life? Oh, yeah. See, that's how simple that thing is. There's just nothing difficult about it at all. To fill out those three columns and learn those three things we've learned about ourselves. Column one, how we resent for we really are. Column two, it's not them we resent, it's what they've done. Column three, it's really not even what they've done. It's how we have chosen to react to a threat to one of our basic instincts of life. Absolutely amazing when we see some of these things on paper. Now that we've got the sheet filled out, let's see what we do with it. He said, we went back, back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. Well, I knew that. Now, to conclude that others was wrong as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse, and then we were sore at ourselves. There's that self-pity. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Now, it's plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours which might have been worthwhile. And I read that last statement that Joe just read. And I tried to look back in my life and see how much time I've squandered in resentments. And I don't know about you guys, but I know about me. And when I've got a good resentment churning around in my head, I'm pretty well paralyzed from doing anything worthwhile. All I really want to do is just sit there and play that thing over and over and over and over and over and over. One of my favorite things that I used to love to do when I was drinking was to get up early in the morning, have a drink of whiskey and a cup of coffee, and turn on my resentment replay machine and replay what she did to me yesterday and replay what he did to me last week and replay what they did to me a month ago and replay what that damn cop did to me three months ago and replay what that damn boss said to me six months ago. 
and replay what my uncle said to me five years ago and replay what my daddy did to me ten years ago and replay, 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 replay. And it took me just about an hour to run through that tape, and I loved every moment of it. And when that tape would run out, I'd have another drink of whiskey and I'd have another cup of coffee, and I would turn on my get-even machine. Now, by God, the next time she does that, here's what I'm going to do, and blah, 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 and spend an hour doing that every morning. Loved every minute of it. As I look back at it now, I can't see that it ever did me any good whatsoever. It never made me any money, that's for sure. Never made me feel better. It only made me feel worse. Never straightened up a relationship with another human being. It only made it worse and worse and worse. I have spent literally thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in resentments. And as far as I can tell, they are absolute, complete, wasted time. Now, I'm beginning to reach the point in my life where I don't have a lot of time left. And for the first time in my life, I am really not only sober, but I'm peaceful and I'm happy and I'm free, and I love to live life today. I didn't know you could live sober and feel the way I feel today. I love every minute of it. And what little time I've got left, I simply refuse to waste any more of it in these damn resentments. All they do is block me off from God, block me off from my fellow man, and make me sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. I just don't intend to do that anymore because I don't have to. I found a way I don't have to do that anymore. Now, the waste of time is one of the bad things about a resentment, but that's not the worst thing. Here's the worst thing about a resentment. But with the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, his business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. There's the worst thing about a resentment. And those resentments are rolling around in our head. And we're blocked off from God. And we don't feel good. And our mind is going to feel that way just so long. It's going to start searching for relief. And we alcoholics will never, never forget the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a couple of drinks. The next thing you know, we begin to think about taking a drink. The next thing you know, we become insane. We believe we can drink, and we end up drinking again. And the book says, for us, to drink is to die. I've seen more people fail in AA because of resentments than I have anything else. Invariably, they're going to get us in trouble for sure. Now, the book says if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. We turn back to the list. You see, this is why you've got to have a written inventory. If you'd taken it in your head, you would have lost it already. We turn back to the list, for it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Always before, I looked at that list to see what those suckers had done to me. Today, I would look at that list to see what those resentments are doing to me. And if they're going to get me drunk, then I'm looking at them from an entirely different angle. We begin to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. And I read that statement, and I stopped, and I thought, Charlie, how dumb can you be? All my life, I've been proud of the fact that I stand on my own two feet. I don't need your advice, thank you. Nobody tells me what to do. And when I read that statement, I suddenly realized that as far back as I can remember, other people have controlled and dominated my thinking through my resentment toward them. If I'm resenting them, they're controlling the way I think. And if they control the way I think, they control my decisions, they control my actions. And I very effectively have turned my life over to other people through my resentments toward them. I did not know that. 
until I did this little inventory. And then I said, man, you really are stupid, aren't you? Because some of these people have been dead and buried in the graveyard for years. They've been reaching out from the grave, and they've had me by the yang-yang as far back as I can remember. And when I saw that, I said to myself, to hell with them. I'm not going to let those people live in my head rent-free any longer. I made a decision to let God direct my thinking, and if they direct it alive or dead, God can't, and it's just that simple. And an amazing thing happened to me right there. We alcoholics fancy ourselves as reasonably intelligent people. Now, I don't think we're smarter than others, but I think we're reasonably intelligent people. And we don't like to look dumb, and we don't like to look stupid. And we see how dumb and how stupid these resentments are. When we see what we've let people do to us through those resentments, that looks so dumb and so stupid that I became absolutely ashamed of it, and about 95% of those resentments just seemed to disappear automatically when I could see what they were doing to me. Absolutely amazing. But if you're like me, there might be one, two, three, or four that have been embedded in your mind so deeply for so long that even though you might be able to see the truth behind them and what they're doing to you, you might find it very difficult to get rid of some of those. And the big book talks about that. It said, how could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be, must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. You can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. He said, this was our course. We realized that the people who had wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help us to show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. And I've spent many, many hours like Charlie in reviewing my resentments in my head. And I've always wanted to get even with those people. Well, I finally found out how you get even with people. The way you get even with them is you pray for them. And when you pray for them, that you're even. You see, I, I didn't know that. And when I got sober, I, my, my last night of drinking, I was sitting on a bar stool, and I had a feeling in my stomach that it was a, it wasn't a uh, throwing up sick. It was a, just a sick, sick feeling, and I didn't know what that was. And I got sober the next day, and uh, about three months later, I went to Apache, Oklahoma, and I went, went to a little AA conference out there. My sponsor took me. And I met a lady there that night. Her name was Alabama Carruthers. Some of you all may have known Alabama. She was a North Hollywood group down in Los Angeles. And I loved Alabama immediately. God, she was so excited about life, and she couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next. And I really loved Alabama. And she said two things that night. Just went, went off in my head like a thunderbolt. One of the things she said is she had a soul sickness. I said, that's that feeling that I had sitting on that bar stool. A soul sickness. I could I could identify with that. And she said another thing. She said I've got peace of mind tonight. And another thunderbolt went off in my head. And I said, My God, I've never had peace of mind. I wonder how she got peace of mind. And later on that night, we were sitting around in the lobby of that old hotel, and it's about three o'clock in the morning. And my little buddy George was laying over in her lap asleep, and I began to talk to Alabama. I said, Alabama, you said you got peace of mind. How did you get peace of mind? And she said, well, Joe, tell me what's going on in your mind. And she's the first person that I really told what was going on in my mind. I didn't talk to things like that about the people. And I said, well, I keep reliving all this stuff, this hurt that has happened to me. I said, old Rose there was my biggest resentment at the time. And I told her about that. I said, I used to leave and go drinking and be gone for a week or two or three and not be back home. And I'd come back in as if I'd just been gone about an hour. That's the kind of drunk I was. And one time I was gone about three months. And I was sitting on the bar stool one night drinking, and I got to thinking. Now, you all know either drink or think, but don't get too big stuff. <laughs> and I got to thinking about old Rose. 
I said, I think I'll go home and visit. Does anybody know what I mean by visit? <laughs> okay, to make sure we're on the same page. I said, I think I'll go home and visit. So I went home and I knocked on the door. Well, sure, she was missing me. I knew she'd be lonely. I mean, wouldn't you be if you hadn't seen me in three months? The way I figured. So I went over there and knocked on the door, and she kind of peeked out a little bit. What I did, I just broke right in there and uh, said, I'm home. And I looked over there, and there was a big old boy in my recliner my, watching my TV in my house, and I'm making payments on all that. Well, what are you going to do? I did. I jumped on that old boy, and he beat me up in my own living room floor. Black my eyes clear down past my glasses, throwed me out in the yard, and told me not to ever come back. Whew. Now, I'm, at this time, I'm divorced from Phyllis, and this is years later. I've been reliving this stuff in my mind daily. And, uh, you know, I took all that negative hate and resentment into my mind into this next marriage. Phyllis had come out of a marriage that was really sick, too. And she was really sick, and we met and got married. <laughs> First time we were met, you know, we met, we were introduced, and she said, you know, Joe, you look like my third husband. And I said, well, how many have you had? And she said, two. <laughs> well, I like that. See, I started thinking real good right in here. <laughs> See, I knew I was going to have, I knew I was going to drink, given. And I knew that I was going to find me a woman that drinks because those women that don't drink are mean and ugly. They throw your stuff out in the yard. That's what Rose always did, throw my stuff out in the yard. Dirty T-shirts, dirty shorts. They never throw anything clean, do they? Yeah. Don't know why. Now, I'm telling all this to, to Alabama. And she said, well, Joe, you're just full of resentments. And I said, well, what is a resentment? She said, resentments are old angers and old hurt that are refelt over and over and over again. You run that over through your mind over and over and over again. And I've done that for years, friends. I mean years. No wonder my marriages couldn't work out. But anyhow, she said, you're full of resentments. I said, is there any solution for this resentment that's going on in my head? And she said, yes, there is. And you have to know, Alabama, she carried a purse that was about that big. And she reached down in that purse, and she began to dig around in there. You know how they do. Anyhow, she, she finally found one of these big books down in there. <laughs> like to never have found it. Anyhow, she pulled this out, and she said, Joe, there's a story in the back of this book about a lady who had a lot of resentments, especially one deep-seated resentment that went on for years and years. She said, if you'll read that, about that and do what she did, it'll probably go away. And she says on page 551 of the big book, Freedom from Bondage. Let's go to 551 and let's look at this little example of how we can get rid of those deep, deep-seated resentments. The third paragraph. She said, I've had many spiritual expenses since I've been in the program, and many that I didn't recognize right away, for I'm slow to learn, and they take many guises. But one was so outstanding, I like to pass it on whenever I can in the hope that it'll help someone else as it helped me. As I said earlier, self-pity and resentment were my constant companions. My inventory began to look like a 33-year diary, for I seemed to have a resentment against everybody I'd ever known. All but one responded to the treatment, suggested in the steps, steps immediately. But this one posed a problem. She got rid of all of the resentments when she could see the truth behind them and see how stupid they really were. They disappeared, all except this one. And it was against my mother. <clears throat> and it was 25 years old. I had fed it, fanned it, and nurtured it as one might a delicate child. And it had become as much a part of me as my breathing. Now look what it did for her. It provided me with my excuses for my lack of education, my marital failures, my personal failures, inadequacy, and, of course, my alcoholism. And though I really thought I'd been willing to part with it, I now knew I was reluctant to let it go. Next morning, however, I realized I had to get rid of it when my reprieve was running out. And if I didn't get rid of it, I was going to get drunk. And I didn't want to get drunk anymore. 
In my prayers that morning, I asked God to point out to me some way to be free of this resentment. During the day, a friend of mine brought me some magazines to a hospital group I was interested in. And I looked through them, and a banner across the front of one featured an article by a prominent clergyman in which I caught the word resentment. He said, in effect, now here it is. If you have a resentment you want to be free of, if you will pray for the person or thing that you resent, you will be free. If you will ask for, in prayer for everything you want for yourself to be given to them, you will be free. Ask for their health, their prosperity, their happiness, and you will be free. Even when you don't really want it for them and your prayers are only words and you don't mean it, go ahead and do it anyway. Do it every day for two weeks and you find you've come to mean it and you want it for them. And you'll realize that where you used to feel bitterness, resentment, and hatred, you now feel compassion, understanding, and love. When I went home after that conference, got in bed that night, and sure enough, my whole mind started running again. And I said, I think I'll pray for those people. And I prayed for them. And the next morning I got up, I said, I think I'll pray for those people. And I prayed for them. And I added some people to the list. The next two or three weeks, I don't know, I was seeing to me like I was in constant prayer day and night. Every time I could think of that, start to go through my head, I'd pray for them. I don't know exactly what happened, but one beautiful spring morning, just after a cold winter in April, I was got caught in a traffic light at the corner of 31st and Lewis in Tulsa. Beautiful area. And beautiful homes, magnificent gardens, a beautiful area. And I got stuck in this traffic light, and I looked over at that house over there. It was real pretty that morning. And the tulips were in full bloom, red and yellow. The grass was green, and the birds were singing, and the squirrels were jumping around in the trees. And I thought to myself, boy, it's a beautiful morning this morning. It sure is nice. And then the thought came to me was, how long has it been, Joe, since you've seen those things? Do you know I don't think I have ever remembered seeing those things up to that moment? Because when they talk about being cut off in the sunlight of the Spirit, I know what that means. I really do. And I realized that then, too, that those people hadn't changed. But my feelings and my thoughts toward them has changed. I really wanted them to have a good life. I really did. I wanted for them what I wanted for myself. See, the best way you get even with people is you pray for them. And when you pray for them, then you're even. And I've learned some things from that. One thing I learned is that love is forgiving. And also love is forgiving. You see. And I am free. Thank God I'm free from that. Now let us tell you something. If you've got a resentment that you don't want to get rid of it, for God's sake, don't pray about it. Because if you do, you're going to lose it. I speak from experience. I had a resentment against a fellow, another one of those that I hated with a purple passion. I would gladly have put him away if I could get by with it too. And I'd worked on all these resentments except this particular one. And one day it began to bug me, and it bugged me bad. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, Neil, I've got a resentment I haven't told you about. And I sat down and I explained to him this resentment, and he said, Oh, Charlie. He said, you've got to get rid of that resentment. And I said, I don't want to get rid of that resentment. And he said, that's beside the point. If you don't, you're going to get drunk. And I said, okay, how in the hell am I going to do that? And he showed me this page 551 in the big book. And he said, read this, go home and do what it says. I went home and I read that and I got down on my knees. I very seldom got on my knees in those days, but I did that day. And I said, God, I want you to give that son of a bitch everything he deserves. <laughs> and that's the only prayer that I had for him that day. But the next day I prayed, and the next day I prayed, and the next day I prayed, and some four or five or six days later, I don't really know when, I found myself saying something I didn't intend to say. I found myself saying, give him and his life the same peace of mind, serenity, and happiness that I seek for myself. And four or five days later, I woke up one morning, and that resentment was absolutely gone, completely gone, never to return. 
And the irony in the whole situation is it wasn't but a matter of two or three months. And that guy moved in as my next door neighbor. And we were allowed to visit back and forth. And we became good friends once again. This thing really does work. And I think the reason it works so good is that when you're praying for the welfare of another human being, that's about the greatest expression of love that one human being can have for another. And love and hate can't exist on the same plane. As you do the praying and expression of the love, then sooner or later that resentment is going to disappear. I just think, if I could get rid of 95% of my resentments because they look so stupid, if I can get rid of the other 5% through prayer, then that means my little display case up here that was filled with resentments, the damage and unsaleable goods, that display case has now been emptied out. And when that display case is now emptied out, then God can begin to direct my thinking. Because you see, there's another natural law that applies here. And it says nature abhors a vacuum. There's no such thing as a vacuum or a void. There's always something rushing in to fill it up. If the resentments disappear, they're going to have to be filled with something else. God's not going to leave another hole in my head. I've got enough of those already. And as resentments have disappeared, I found that my mind began to be filled in that area of my mind with a little peace of mind, a little serenity, a little love, a little patience, a little tolerance, and a little goodwill toward my fellow man. Now that's God's thinking. My thinking was the resentments, but God's thinking is exactly the opposite of that. And I found that the love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill, I didn't have to read any other books to find it. I didn't have to go to any other fellowships to find it. If God dwells within me, and I believe that he does because my book says he does, if God dwells within me, that's always been a part of my makeup. I just could, never could use it before. In my chase for money, power, prestige, sex, and what I thought were the good things of life, those feelings had to be repressed to let me operate on the level that I wanted to operate on. But as the resentments disappeared, then those things automatically began to come to the surface. And I find now in one-third of my store, I'm in much less chance of getting drunk now than I was when I started. The resentments have disappeared. They've been replaced by love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill toward my fellow man. You see, there's nothing negative about any of these action steps. Every one of these procedures we follow will have a positive happening. I am building the personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism, and I'm already beginning to build it as these resentments disappear and they're replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill toward my fellow man. Have you ever seen anything this simple? Is there anything complicated about what we've been talking about doing? You know, you don't even have to understand why you have to do it. All you got to do is just do it. And if you do it, you'll be absolutely amazed at the changes that will take place. Didn't write down any dirty things either, did we? Now, it would do me no good, though, to get rid of those resentments if I didn't know how to keep them from coming back. Because the world's full of sick people. They're going to do it to me again tomorrow. If I'm not careful, I'll resent. And I can't have just one. You let me have one and a little bit, I've got two. And then I've got four, and then I've got eight, and then I've got 16, and then I've got 32, and then I'm a basket case all over again. I have to do one more thing about these resentments, and then we'll be through with them. Let's go back to page 67. Let's go back to the paragraph down in the, in the middle of the page. It says, 
referring to our list again. See, that's why you've got to have a written inventory. Referring to our list again. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Man, we've never done this before. We've always looked to see what those suckers have done to us. Never did we look to see the part that we might have played in it. Never did we look to see our own mistakes. Or had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly. And we're willing to set these matters straight. So I got out my inventory sheet. And I looked at that first name on that sheet, that lady named Barbara. I said, now, Charlie, you do what your book's telling you to do. You forget what Barbara did to you. Disregard those three divorces entirely. You look to see where you were at blame. What did you do to set this thing in motion? And it took me about five seconds. And I said, if I hadn't been out there screwing around, I wouldn't have got caught at it. If I hadn't got caught at it, she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce. Now, I think Joe calls that adultery. I don't know what he's putting up there. I call it just plain screwing around. Just a few more seconds of thinking, and I said, you know, if you hadn't have been sneaking around behind her back and lying to her all the time about where you've been and what you've been doing and what you're going to do, she might not have filed for divorce in the first place. It took me just a few minutes longer to say, if I hadn't spending, been spending all of our money on what I thought was so important, if I'd really, really thought about my wife and my kids, I wouldn't have been doing those kind of things, and she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. If you'll notice on that fourth column, it says, What did I do? Putting out of the mind wrongs others had done, I resolutely looked for my own mistakes. What did I do, if anything, to set in motion trains of circumstances which in turn caused people or institutions to hurt me and eventually led to my resentment of them for doing so? And for the first time, I looked at that resentment honestly. And for the first time, I began to realize why I loved that resentment. If I'd sit there and play that resentment over and over and over in my head, concentrating on what she had done to me, and let me play it long enough, I distort the picture to where it all becomes entirely her fault and makes me as pure as the driven snow, and I don't have to look at myself and I don't have to change me. That's why I love that resentment. I looked at the Internal Revenue Service. I said, now, Charlie, you forget what they're doing to you. You forget the fact that they're trying to put you in jail. What did you do, if anything, to set that in motion? And it's very simple. I cheated on my income tax, and they caught me. And rather than look at me and see the kind of thief that I was, I played the resentment over and over and over and over and distorted the picture. And I made them the devil. I made me as pure as a driven snow. And I thought, my God, Charlie, how many more of these resentments do you have that are like that? And I went through my sheet of 152 resentments. 
And I never found the one that I hadn't done something to them. And they had retaliated. And I had resented them for doing so. And I had played it over and over and over and distorted the picture and made them the devil and made me as pure as the driven snow. If you're a practicing alcoholic, you've got to develop these kind of skills. I don't think you and I could live with ourselves if we had to honestly see what's going on when we're out there doing our thing. But you see, we don't ever have to see that because we've got these resentments and we play them over and over and distort the picture and transfer all blame to others, make ourselves as pure as the driven snow, and then we can go ahead and live the kind of life that we're wanting to live. And we men go from woman to woman to woman. And you ladies go from man to man to man. And we go from job to job to job. And we go from city to city to city. And we go from state to state to state and it's always their damn fault. I don't believe we could have lived with ourselves if we didn't have that ability. For the first time, I truthfully looked at my resentments and I could see the part that I had played in each one of them. And all they did for me, to me, was just retaliate against me for what I had done for them. And I didn't see that till I got this down on paper. The book says, where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened? And we've added the word consider inconsiderate because it's going to show up at a couple pages anyhow. In that fifth column, it says, where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate? Which of the above character defects caused me to do what I did? It caused me to want to hold on to the old resentment, even though I may have done nothing to cause it. And I sat down again <clears throat> with this thing with Barbara. And I said, Charlie, when you were out there screwing around, sneaking around behind her back and lying to her and blowing all the money, were you selfish when you were doing so? You better, better was. I was interested in satisfaction of self, period. And I was doing what I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do it and the hell with the rest of them. I said, Charlie, did you have any dishonesty involved there? And you know that I did because I'd rather lie to her than tell her the truth, even if the truth might have come easier. I said, Charlie, were you self-seeking and frightened? Was fear involved in that? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. I was approaching 40 years of age. And I was saying to myself, man, if you don't get out there and get some of that now while you can, it'll soon be too late to do that. Fear drives us to do those things that hurt other people. I said, Charlie, were you inconsiderate? And I said, oh, yeah. If I really considered my wife and my children's needs and wants ahead of my own, I wouldn't have been out there doing the things that I did that created the problems. See, those are the four basic character defects talked about in the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. All other character defects stem from these four. And in, in the push and the drive for the satisfaction of the basic instincts of life with no God in our lives. To satisfy those instincts, we must become selfish people. We have to become dishonest because we're doing things we shouldn't be doing and we got to lie and cheat and steal in order to do those things. We've got to be frightened people. We've got to be inconsiderate of other human beings. I looked at the Internal Revenue Service. I said, were you selfish here? Sure, I was selfish. I wanted that money not for my wife, and I wanted that money for me so that I could go do the things that I wanted to do. Was I dishonest with the internal? You bet you I was dishonest with the Internal Revenue Service. And as I began to fill out that fifth column, I began to see what I had become through living a lifetime run on self-will. Now, I didn't like it. 
almost made me sick. You see, I always thought I was a pretty good guy. I always knew that I drank too much. But I always thought I always considered other people and their needs and wants. I always thought I was a pretty honest fellow until I really, really began to fill out that fifth column and see how selfish I really was, how dishonest I had become, how self-seeking and frightened I was, how inconsiderate of other people I was. And I didn't like what I saw. And I began to see that if I want to live free of these resentments in the future, I'm going to have to do something about those things out there in that fifth column. Because if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, then I'm going to keep right on doing the same things I've always done. I'm going to keep right on hurting people and institutions. And they're going to retaliate against me, and I'm going to resent them for doing so, and I'm going to end up drunk over it. But just think, if I could become a little less selfish, I don't have to be perfect, I never will be, but if I could become a little less selfish, if I could become a little more honest, if I could begin to operate with a little courage instead of so much fear, if I could even begin to consider other people and their needs and their wants ahead of my own, then just maybe, maybe, I wouldn't be hurting so many people. And if I don't hurt them, they're not going to retaliate. And if they don't retaliate, then I'm not going to have to resent. And probably I'm not going to have to get drunk over it. At the very, very least, I'm going to have to do something about those things I see out there in that fifth column. If I want any peace of mind and serenity, and if I want to be free from resentments in the future, You see, what we're really doing with this sheet of paper here, we're in the process of doing step four. This is the resentment part of the inventory. So we'll put a little four up there at the top of the sheet. In the fifth column, I now see the exact nature of the wrongs that I'm going to talk to another human being about in step five. The resentment is the wrong... But what is the exact nature of it? What is the truth of it? What's at the core of it? What's the inherent characteristic that causes it? And I begin to see that selfishness and dishonesty, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate was at the root of every resentment that I had. And that's what I'm going to talk about to another human being in step five. See, when a man comes to me with step five, I don't care how many times he's committed adultery. What I really want to know is what's with him that causes him to do that. Is he doing it because of selfishness? Is he doing it out of fear? Is he doing it out of inconsideration? That's the exact nature of the wrong. I don't care how many times he's stolen. What we want to find out is what's within him that causes him to steal. Did he steal to impress other people? Did he steal through outright selfishness? Did he steal through inconsideration? Those are the things we're going to talk about in step five. You see, this is not a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items. Also in the fifth column, I now see the defects of character that I'm going to become willing to turn loose of in step six. Knowing full well that if I hang on to them, they're going to get me drunk. And I'm going to become willing to turn loose of them in step six. Also in the fifth column, I now see the shortcomings. I'm going to ask God to take away in step seven. And as he takes those things away, And they become less and less, and maybe I can learn to live without hurting other people. Now, in your case, some of them. In my case, all of them in column one. 
were people and institutions that I had harmed in the past. And then they retaliated, and then I resented. So every name in column one for me is going to come off of this sheet and be added to a sheet to be used later on for steps eight and nine. When we get to step eight, the book says we've got the list. We made it and we took step four. And we're going to find that most of those resentments, we have harmed them also, even though they have harmed us too. You see, I've set myself up here with all the information I need for steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, resentment-wise. Have you ever seen anything that simple? It really does work. Now, I hear some of you saying, and I, and I hear good, I hear awful good. <laughs> there are some of you saying, well, Charlie, that's probably true. For those that we have harmed. <clears throat> but how about those that harmed us and we didn't have anything to do with it? How about those that hurt us as kids growing up? <clears throat> how about the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the mental abuse? How about the harms done to us in our marriages? Aren't we justified in having that kind of resentment? Well, I guess we are if we want to get drunk over it. But you see, a justified resentment blocks you off from the sunlight of the Spirit. The same as an unjustified resentment blocks you off from the sunlight of the Spirit. Whoever you are resenting, justified or unjustified, they are controlling your thinking. And we've made a decision to let God direct our thinking. And if they do it, justified or unjustified, God can't, and it's just that simple. Now, I've heard ever since I've been in A about these awful, awful, abusive things that's happened to us, especially to you ladies in the sexual area. Now, let me tell you something. It didn't happen to this you. It happened to us, too. I don't know how many fifth steps I've taken with other human beings, and almost invariably, there's the same kind of thing in our backgrounds as in the backgrounds of the women, too. Now, if you've got one of those, knowing full well that it might get you drunk, and you don't want to get rid of it, for God's sake, put it down on this sheet of paper. Put down who they were. Put down what did they do to you. Put down the part of self that was affected. Put down what did I do, if anything, in this case, nothing. But then let's look into the fifth column and let's see if our own selfishness, our own dishonesty, Maybe our own fear of facing life without that resentment. Maybe our inconsideration for another human being keeps us holding on to that resentment, even though we know it might get us drunk. You know, the greatest excuse in the world is to say, well, I could have done that if they hadn't have done that to me and it's all their damn fault. The greatest excuse in the world to say, well, I wouldn't have to be doing this if they hadn't have done to me. And it's their fault, not mine. They call that rationalization and justification. The lady in the book, this resentment against her mother, she knew it was going to get her drunk, but she didn't want to get rid of it. She used it to justify her lack of education. If Mama had to have done that to me, I could have gotten an education bull. She could have gotten an education if she had really wanted one bad enough. Mama couldn't have stopped her if she had really wanted to. She used it 
to justify her marital failure. Bull. Mama didn't have anything to do with her marital failure, but that's a great excuse to blame it on Mama. She even blamed her mother for her alcoholism. Bull. I'll tell you why she became alcoholic. She kept on drinking whiskey. <laughs> and Mama didn't pour it down her. But the greatest excuse in the world is to say, well, it's all their fault. And if we've got one of those and we don't want to get rid of them, we better look at it closely. Because we're using it to rationalize, rationalize. We're using it to justify. Not doing what we really should do or just as importantly doing things we shouldn't be doing. Are we so dishonest with ourselves that we refuse to see the truth about it? Now, if you've got a resentment in your head today, believe me, it isn't true. I'm going to say that again. If you've got a resentment in your head today, it isn't true. Oh, it started with truth. But if you've played it over and over and over, you distorted the picture and you're really not seeing the truth about it today. Are we so dishonest that we refuse to see the truth? Are we so afraid of facing life? Because you know if you're going to have to face life without that resentment, then that means you're going to have to be responsible for yourself and your own behavior. Does fear keep us holding on to it? Are we so inconsiderate of another human being that we fail to realize that people that do those things to us, they're not necessarily bad people, they're sick people. And they do it out of sickness rather than badness. They didn't necessarily do it to us anyhow. They would have done it to anybody in that kind of situation. If we could even begin to consider those things, maybe we could start a forgiving process before it's too late. Maybe we could straighten up a relationship with another human being before it's too late. In other words, we can be completely free of all of these resentments, justified or unjustified, if we really wish to. And if all else fails, we can always pray for those suckers. Now, if I pray for one of those that I have a justified resentment against, that doesn't mean that I approve of what they did. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to walk hand in hand with them and trip the light fantastic the rest of my life. What it means is I'm tired of letting them make me sick. It really doesn't make any sense for one of us to let somebody hurt us 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago and then let them hurt us every day for the rest of our lives through our resentment toward them. We can be free of those things also if we want to. Now, if you don't believe this, don't try it. Because if you really start looking at these things honestly, and if you really, really want to do something about them, you'll be able to get rid of those kind of resentments too. And then you're free. As long as you're resenting, you're not free. They've got you by the yang yang, and they might kill you, just as sure as anything. The question is, do you want to be free, or do you want to be sick, or do you want to be well? If you want to be well, pray for them. You know, sometimes on this time of the day, Friday night, we talk about sex. But I've got a headache. Let's, let's save sex and fears for tomorrow morning. Saturday morning is a good time to have sex. You, you guys tomorrow morning are going to be the most beautiful. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. And it's truly by God's grace and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of the in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm sober this morning. From that, I am very, very thankful. And I'd like to read the preamble, please. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other. 
that they may solve their common problem to help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And I can't stand it anymore. I've got to tell another story. <laughs> this story involves three boys, about like George there and Charlie and I. They were about 22, 23 years old, and they were still in the sixth grade. I have to kind of get the picture there. The principal wanted them out of the sixth grade desperately, so he called in the office one day. He said, boys, I'm going to ask you all a question. If you get to answer these questions, you can go on to the seventh grade. So I asked George there a question. He said, George, what is it that women have two of that men like to get their hands on? And he thought for a long time, and finally he said, well... Women have two hands. Men like to get whole women's hands. He said, that's good, George, you're in the seventh grade. Looked at Charlie and said, now, Charlie, he said, what is it that men have one of that women like to get their hands on? And he thought for a long time, and finally he said, well, men have one billfold. Women like to get their hands on a man's billfold. He said, that's good, Charlie. He said, you're in the seventh grade. He looked at me and said, now, Joe, I'm going to ask you a simple question. I said, God, I hope so. I missed those first two. <laughs> The main problem of the alcoholic sent is in the mind. Uh, Are you through? I'm finished. <laughs> Morning, everybody. My name is Charlie Farm, and I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic. That's all right. Because I'm a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the grace of the power that I found in the 12 step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink for 12,015 days today one day at a time, and for this I'm very grateful. Man, you guys look great this morning. My God, there's not a resentment left in the whole bunch. You know? <laughs> I saw one back there. <laughs> How many of you went back to where you were staying last night and worked on at least one resentment? Could I see your hands? Yeah, a bunch of you did. How many of you got rid of at least one resentment? Could I see your hands? Yeah, a bunch of you did. How many of you did we give a new resentment to last night? Can I see your hands? <laughs> Pray for us. We need the prayers and you need to practice. <clears throat> they tell me in AA you shall know the truth and it makes you matter in hell once in a while. Too. <laughs> we, uh, we did the resentment part of the inventory last night. We did it first simply because that's the way the big book does it. The big book says it is the number one offender. It seems to destroy more alcoholics than anything else. And we found out as we worked our way through those different columns, uh, dealing with those resentments, we began to see that the resentments we had in our mind in the majority of the cases really were not true. Uh, we began to see for the first time, while taking a moral, truthful inventory, that in a majority of the resentments that we had, that we ourselves had done something based on self, trying to satisfy the three basic instincts of life that ended up creating harms and hurts for other people and institutions and etc. And we could see where they retaliated against us, creating pain and suffering for us. Then we in turn would play those resentments over and over and over in our head and as we did, each time we played them, we would gradually distort the picture, finally, finally transfer all blame to others, make them the devil and make ourselves as pure as the driven snow. And I think we made the statement that if you're a good practicing alcoholic, you've got to be able to develop those kind of skills. I doubt if we could really live with ourselves if we had to honestly see <clears throat> what was going on and we were out there doing our thing. So for the first time in our lives, we could really see the truth about those resentments, and we can see that they all stem from us, and we also could see that they usually involved certain character defects, that it's because of our own selfishness and our own dishonesty and our own selfish, self-seeking, frightened condition, our own 
<clears throat> in consideration of other human beings caused us to do the things that hurt other people and then caused them to retaliate. And we could begin to see that if we wanted to be free of resentments in the future, that it was really going to be necessary for us to start changing some of those things that we found out in that fifth column. If we could become a little less selfish, a little less dishonest, a little less self-seeking frightened, a little less inconsiderate of others, and maybe we wouldn't do so many things that hurt other people, they in turn it wouldn't have to retaliate against us, and then we in turn would not have to resent them for doing so. And we found through the resentment process that they could be removed from our minds when we actually could see the truth behind them, see what we were doing with them, and see how we were letting other people control our thinking and controlling our lives through our resentments toward them, that a great majority of the resentments just began to disappear automatically when we saw how dumb and how stupid it was to really let other people control and direct our thinking through resentments. You know, we made a decision in step three to let God direct it, and if other people direct it through our resentments toward them, then God can't, and it's just that simple. So a lot of them disappeared automatically when we could really see the truth, truth behind them. We also found that if we had some deep, deep-seated resentments that did not disappear through the inventory process, that we could use prayer in order to get rid of those also. <clears throat> Asking God to give those people or those institutions in their lives the same peace of mind, serenity, happiness, prosperity that we wanted for ourselves. And eventually through prayer, then those resentments could be removed also. And what we really, <clears throat> really were able to do then, we were able to remove the damaged and unsaleable goods, the damaged stock in trade called resentments. We also made the statement that if the resentments disappear, then they're going to have to be replaced with something else. God's not going to leave another hole in our head. We've got enough of those already. And as those resentments begin to disappear, we begin to find in our minds for the first time a little bit of love and patience and tolerance and compassion and goodwill. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.